Hi, my name is Paul Grogan, and in this Gaming Rules video, I'm going to be giving you an overview of Days of Ire, Budapest 1956, which, as the name suggests, is a historical board game set during a difficult time in Hungarian history. The game is inspired by real events, and really captures the feel of what went on in the city during October of 1956. Days of Ire is for one to four players, with one player taking on the role of the Soviet commander, and the other players playing revolutionary ringleaders. Also included in the game is a fully cooperative variant, removing the need for one player to play the role of the Soviets. The game plays through the first seven days of the revolution. If the revolutionaries stay alive and manage to keep the city together, they win. But if one ringleader falls, the fighter's morale plummets, or the city suffers too much by the time the fighting is finished, the Soviet player wins. Before I go into more details of the video, I just need to say that this is a pre-production copy that I've been given, and the components that you see here are not going to be the final ones. The actual components, especially the, uh, the tiles, are going to be much thicker cardboard than just what's pictured here. So anyway, on with the video. The game takes place over seven rounds, with each round representing one day. Each round is divided into three phases. The Soviet phase is first, where the Soviet player gets to play headline cards, trigger events, and move Soviet tanks. In the revolutionary phase, each revolutionary gets to carry out a number of actions, which could include activating fighters, resolving events, or attacking militia. Finally, in the SPA phase, the Soviet player executes orders for the Hungarian State Protection Authority, activating the militia and snipers on the board, and using them to attack. The game normally ends after the seventh day, when the two sides sit down to negotiate. If at that time there are four or less events in play, the revolutionary players win. If there are more than four events in play, the Soviet player wins. There is also certain situations which might cause the game to end early. If this happens, one of the sides immediately wins the game. The first step of the Soviet phase is where the Soviet player gets to play headline cards from their hand. There are two types of headline cards, red ones, which are good for the Soviet player, and green ones, which help the revolutionaries. So why would the Soviet player want to play the green cards if they help the revolutionaries? Well, this card play mechanic is quite clever. When playing a red card, the Soviet player can either choose to gain the command points shown in the top left, or perform the effect on the bottom half of the card. And when playing a green card, the Soviet player gains the command points shown, but also gives the revolutionaries the ability on the card. Alternatively, if the Soviet player doesn't want to give the revolutionaries the ability, they can discard the card to no effect, but then they don't get the command points on it. Command points gained can then be spent on triggering event cards currently on display. The cost to do so is shown in the top left of the card and modified by the position next to the board, with minor events marked with an X costing a variable amount based on how many minor events are currently in play. When an event is triggered, it's placed on the relevant space of the board. Some events say specifically where to place them, others give the Soviet player a choice. Remember, at the end of the game, the Soviet player wins if there are more than four events in play, and this is why the Soviet player wants to get more event cards on the board. Finally, any remaining command points can be used to move existing Soviet tanks or even place a new one on the board. In the revolutionary phase, the revolutionary players get four actions to divide between them. So if you're playing with just one revolutionary player, they get four actions. If you're playing with two revolutionary players, they get two actions each. And if you're playing with three revolutionary players, then the first player to act gets two actions, and the other players get one. There are seven different actions possible, and many of them require the playing of revolutionary cards, which are a valuable resource for the revolutionary players. To resolve an event, for instance, one of the revolutionaries must be at the appropriate location and play cards to match all the icons needed by the event. For example, to resolve this event, a revolutionary would need to play cards with one radio icon and three food icons. This could be done by playing these cards. The food supplies provides two food icons, the newspaper providing the radio icon, and the aid card providing the remaining food. Note that this aid card only provides one of these three icons, not all three. 
Now, that's quite expensive, costing three cards, but there are ways to reduce the cost. These green tiles are fighters, inspired by some of the individuals who fought during the revolution. Many of the fighters have resource icons on them, which contribute to resolving any event in their location, meaning you need to play less cards to resolve the event. So in the previous example, if this fighter was here, it would provide a food icon, meaning that the event could be resolved with only these two cards. When an event is resolved, its effect is applied and then the card is discarded. This one, for example, shifts support towards the Hungarian side. So I take the support marker and move it one space in this direction. Also as an action, a revolutionary player can play cards with bullet icons to attack militia in the same location as them. And again, any matching icons from fighters in that location can be added. Each bullet removes one militia, which helps to restrict the options of the Soviet player during the SPA phase. Often the revolutionary players will need to share cards with each other, and this can only be done if they are at the same location. As an action, a player can give or take any number of cards to or from one other player. The presence of Soviet tanks can really hinder the revolutionary players. Whenever an action is performed at any location with a Soviet tank, the Soviet player rolls a die. On a 1-3, to three, the acting revolutionary player takes one hit, which can either be applied to remove a fighter in the location, remove a friendly tank or barricade, or take an injury. Too many injuries and the revolutionary is killed, meaning an immediate win for the Soviet player. At the end of this phase, the revolutionary players draw a number of cards from the shared deck equal to the position of the marker on the morale track. These cards are then shared out between the players without looking at them. The third phase of each round is where the Soviet player gets to use SPA cards to activate the militia and snipers of the State Protection Authority. These cards allow the movement of militia and snipers around the board, placing new militia, or using SPA units to attack. As SPA cards are played, they're placed in order in a discard queue, and certain headline cards allow the player to retrieve the ones on the bottom, so the order is important. After all three phases are complete, the day marker is moved to the next round. And unless the end of the game has been triggered earlier, the end of round 7 marks the end of the game. Just a bit more on the cooperative version of the game, the Soviet player is replaced by an AI, the Zukov deck, which gets progressively stronger throughout the game as it places events and triggers headlines. The Zukov deck also means that the game can be played solo. I hope you found this video useful in learning how to play Days of Ire Budapest 1956, and if you like what you've seen here, then please subscribe to my channel to check out some of my other videos. Until next time, take care and thanks for watching.